Hello, everyone, and welcome to this super cool and fun edition of the live stream here at the Northeast Georgia History Center. This is, came in to us as a request uh, to do a history of puppetry and take a look at even modern puppetry. So we took up that challenge because this is something that is a lot of fun to think about when you start thinking about it. So many of us, of course, are consumers of popular culture and movies and television. We've, I'm sure, gone to, to puppet shows and things like that. But you really stop and think about how much of our entertainment has been and continues to be puppetry focused. And by puppets, of course, I mean usually anthropomorphic or creature-based things that are usually smaller in size and are manipulated in a way that is supposed to make the audience or the viewer think that that is the actor, that that is the thing taking the action, not a, not a human being. A simplistic definition, but, but these puppets have been around for a long, long time. And it's no surprise that they go back even to the ancient world. Uh, the ancient Greeks themselves had puppets. We know about this from sources such as the Iliad and Herodotus. It's a little vague, but they are there nonetheless. And they appear to be, we think, sort of the marionette style, the, the humans on strings. You can see from this photograph over here some, some originals from the time. At first, when these were first found, it was believed that these were simply dolls, but people began to look at them, began to see uh, points to fix strings on them and perhaps ah perhaps this is perhaps this is an actual puppet they had them in ancient egypt as well uh usually for religious purposes uh usually for uh the theater it's not quite theater the way th we think of it but nevertheless they were anthropomorphic things that were moved by someone else to give a focus on that thing of telling a story so it goes very, very far back and continues on through Roman. There are references to Byzantium, to Eastern Roman Empire, and of course during Roman times to very entertaining puppetry shows, uh, some of them uh, based on religious ceremonies, some of them based on what, what we would today call situational comedy, uh, some of them quite crass and crude, as a matter of fact, not necessarily specifically for a children's edition. We often think today of of puppetry is something for children, but we're going to learn that that is not remotely the case. And moving on into the uh, medieval period, we even see that there is some sort of puppetry-based entertainment going on in the medieval period. You've got this great illustration here of, of two puppeteers making two armed men fight each other. And I, man, I wish I could have seen this. First of all, I would have liked to have seen it. Second of all, I would have loved to have seen what a medieval toy knight action figure looked like, but, but I digress. That's simply for me personally. Um, and, you know, moving on from the medieval period into the Renaissance period, you start getting a lot of other different forms of entertainment. And this grows uh, significantly in this time period during the Renaissance and especially with the coming of the Commedia dell'arte tradition sort of really lent itself to puppetry, especially a sort of marionette puppetry, because the the over-the-top costumes, the over-the-top face masks could be easily replicated in miniature with some of these puppets, and they could do things that the, the larger ones couldn't do. They could travel to distant lands. Uh, they could whack each other over the top of the head with a stick really, really hard. Is there anything funnier than one puppet knocking the other over the head with a stick? Probably not. Um, but that tradition continued, and this is when we really also start to see sort of the development of a, of a screen, sort of something to, perp in, in European uh, puppetry anyway, something to sort of hide the puppeteers themselves to add a sense of reality that the puppets you're seeing are actual real things and to, and to help with that suspension of disbelief. And moving on, you can see that even further into the 18th century here in this, in this image of a British puppet show here, uh, not here, but in England, and you can see that it is, this is great because it not only shows the puppeteer at work, it shows the puppet, it shows the way the stage, the screen would have looked, but it also gives us excellent, excellent uh, evidence that they were going to be using musical accompaniment as well. And that means that this is definitely turning into a full-scale show. And from the 18th century on, puppetry becomes a very legitimate, very popular form of entertainment. When you think about it, and you'll hear this from some of the folks we've interviewed, puppetry can be 
really easy to to move around, right? You don't have to move huge sets for for human size actors. You don't have to bring all these costumes. You can make five or ten or fifteen different puppets, put them in one box, throw them in the back of a of a cart or a wagon or even later an automobile and travel them around wherever you need to go. And you can bring in an entire cast, you can bring in an entire show or series of shows with only one or two puppeteers to perform the the play or the presentation or what have you. So this becomes very popular, especially in the 20th century with the coming of different modes of transportation such as trains uh, and automobiles. They're able to move it so much easy, more easily, and it becomes very, very uh, familiar to much of the American audience. And in, in American history, puppetry really takes on a new life with each new medium. Now, it may seem sort of silly uh, to think of puppetry being broadcast over the radio, but nevertheless, this was something that was very popular. In this next image, you're going to see uh, one of the more popular uh, puppets, a uh, ventriloquist by the name of Charlie McCarthy. Believe it or not, Charlie McCarthy had a radio show, uh, and often what they would do is they would perform this live before an audience, and then the broadcast, and then the performance would either be recorded or it would be broadcast live. And this is how the show went across the airways, and it became very, very popular. Seems weird, but it's it's the honest truth. And so when television finally comes along in the in the late '40s and early '50s, and that growth of the American need to consume television shows, puppetry continues to be a major medium. And this is, when you think about it, this is absolutely fascinating. Uh, the fact that here in the in the end of the 20th century and here in the 21st century, despite the massive advances in, in the technology of entertainment, in broadcast, in special effects, puppets are still with us. And and to the uh, the next to Charlie McCarthy, you can see one of the hit television Puppets, Howdy Doody. This is in the very early days of broadcast television. This is a series, The Howdy Doody Show. I'm sure some of you watching may remember the old famous song, It's Howdy Doody Time. Uh, Howdy Doody uh, was an incredibly popular show, and it was broadcast across the nation. It had great ratings, and kids grew up loving this. And for a time, for, for most of television, uh, early television's early history, you see puppetry and puppet-based entertainment really focused on kids, on, on children's entertainment, and that kind of creates this modern idea that perhaps puppetry entertainment is for kids. But as we're going to see coming on, that is not remotely the case. Uh, some things begin to change, and with some new advents, not only in the technology of puppetry, but in how they're able to tell different stories and sort of make it for a wider range of and, and age range of audiences, you start to get some things. And probably for most Americans, at least most Americans my age and, and around my age, when we think of puppetry entertainment, we think of one thing, the Muppets, right? The Muppets have come to be the quintessential American performance uh, of puppet of puppetry and puppetry arts. And thanks to Jim Henson and Jim Henson Studios, well, it started with just the Muppets and things like Sesame Street and things like that have burgeoned into this remarkable media success. They Puppets are on television, they are in movies, and even um, things that have a lot of CGI still relied on puppetry until very recently, and sometimes they still do. I'm thinking, you know, of of Men in Black, which doesn't seem that long ago that that came out, and a lot of new things, and even... And even very, very recently, right, we have uh, Star Wars, which has been popular since the 1970s and which involved a lot of puppetry in the original trilogy. We get to today, and one of the most popular television shows is Mandalorian. And this is put out by Disney, who is a leader in puppetry, but also a leader in technology and computer graphics and things like that. And they are using some amazing uh, filming technologies and procedures now, and yet the central character of this show that has become more popular than arguably anyone else that has captured the hearts of everyone who watches it is what we call Baby Yoda. And Baby Yoda is a simple puppet. There is, there's no CG to him. Uh, he's the, When you see Baby Yoda moving around, it's a puppet. It is 
hand manipulated and hand created. It exists in three dimensions. It is a practical effect. So even today, um, we're still using methods of telling stories of entertainment that stretches back literally, literally millennia. And that is absolutely fascinating to know that something that started so long ago continues to be with us to this present day, not only continues to be with us, but continues to thrive everywhere. And so one of the great things that we wanted to do with this live stream is instead of just having us tell you about the history of puppetry, why not bring in some folks who are keeping this art form very much alive and very entertaining? The Northeast Georgia History Center is in Gainesville, Georgia, which is not too far north of Atlanta, a much larger metropolis. But one of the things we are so lucky to have so close to us and that Atlanta is very fortunate to have is the Center for Puppetry Arts. When you listen to a lot of our other interviewees, you're going to see that most of them mention the Center for Puppetry Arts in some way. It has become the mecca for burgeoning performers, performers for professional performers. It has a very close association with the Henson Foundation and the Henson Company. Uh, if We're so lucky. You can go there and they have rotating exhibits. Of course, I'm going to be focused on the exhibits of all these different shows. Uh, they've had uh, puppets from the Labyrinth, from the Muppet Show, from Dark Crystal, things like that. It's just so amazing to have so close at hand. But they're not just a museum and an archive, they are an active performance theatrical group. And when you go down there, they are constantly having different shows where people, they bring artists in uh, for workshops to hone their craft. They have conferences. They are a fantastic resource. And like I said, it is awesome to have them so close by. So let's hear a little bit more about the Center for Puppetry Arts. Hi, I'm Jeff Domke, the Associate Education Director at the Center for Puppetry Arts. We are located in Atlanta, and we are the largest organization in the country focused on the art of puppetry, possibly in the entire world. Now, we have a mission statement at the Center for Puppetry Arts, and it is to inspire imagination, education, and community through the global art of puppetry. We have three areas we focus on at the Center for Puppet Arts. We have our performances. We have amazing puppet shows. We also have an amazing world-class museum. And then we also have the education department. And that is where we are located right now. Now, today I want to show you the five basic types of puppetry. There are so many different types of puppetry around the globe, but these are the five basic. Okay? The first one I talk about is a rod puppet. Some people may call it a stick puppet, but I want to show you a rod puppet. This is a puppet that comes from the country known as the Republic of Mali. Okay? This represents a farmer puppet. He has a long rod that's made out of wood that goes through his body and rods that connect to his arms so he can raise his arms up like this. One, two, or he can just go woohoo! Woohoo! So that is a rod puppet from the Republic of Mali. Another type of puppet I want to show you is known as a glove puppet because it basically fits on your hand like a glove. This one comes from Taiwan and it's known as Budashi. And it's really cool. This is a general in the army. My hand fits inside like this. My index finger's in his head. My thumb is over in one hand and three fingers over here. And I go, really amazing things in Taiwan with these puppets. They have all kinds of acrobatics and battle scenes. So they're very beautiful, very impressive. They use calligraphy pens to, uh, pens to actually decorate and give the details to the face. So that one comes from Taiwan. Another style of puppetry you might know of is a string puppet, also known as a marionette. This is a very special one that comes from Europe in a country known as Prague. You can see it's got strings connected to its arms and right here to his knees. He also has a metal rod that comes straight out of his head so I can make him turn really fast like this. Right here is a very special wooden mechanism. So I tilt that back and forth. Watch what his legs will do. Beep, 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 beep. His arms can also go up. Woo, woo, just like that. So it's a very special puppet coming from Prague in the Czech Republic. 
Next, I want to show you body puppets, okay? Body puppets will usually have some kind of moving part on them. They'll have eyelids that maybe move or mouths that move. These come from China. Maybe you've seen these in big celebrations. There's two people inside. One person is in the front controlling the head, maybe the mouth movement or eyelids, and another person in the back, and they do all this amazing acrobatics. Those are body puppets, okay? Now, the last type, the fifth type, is known as a shadow puppet. Here is our shadow screen, usually made of a wooden frame with some kind of fabric or material. The light source coming from behind. When we bring our hand close to the light, it's a larger shadow. We get closer, it becomes more vibrant. So I want to show you these two puppets that come from the country known as Turkey. And this is Karagos. Hey, I'm Karagos. And this is Hajiva. Hello, how are you? And they are beautiful puppets. They use mineral dyes to make the different colors. They're made from the skin of a camel. They dry the skin out and use special tools to cut all the beautiful shapes out. These two characters never get along. There's some great stories about those two Turkish shadow puppets. Now, I hope you'll find some time to maybe visit the Center for Puppetry Arts. And I really appreciate your time. This is a very special type of puppet. It's known as a moving mouth hand puppet. Hey guys, how's it going? I think I need some new glasses. So thanks for, for joining and watching and hope to see you soon. So now we're going to talk about one of my personal favorite types of puppetry, shadow puppetry. The history of this one goes we, we know at least back to the 18th century, perhaps to the 17th and 16th centuries. And all of you are familiar with this. It is a translucent piece of, of fabric or something that is up against the screen. And then it is backlit and the puppets go up against the screen. So the shadows are sort of blocked from the light and it allows you to do a lot of really neat special effects that you couldn't normally do with, you know, traditional three-dimensional in the round hand puppetry or something like that. You can have people fly, you can have, you know, fire-breathing dragons, you can have the sun go up and down. It's absolutely remarkable and it and the reason I like it so much personally is because it can do a lot with mood and of course, as we discussed earlier, that mood can be enhanced by including a lot of different sound effects and a lot of different music that goes along with it because this is, a, after all, a performance art. So we're going to talk to uh, Mr. Nick Darty, who uh, performs with his wife a great shadow puppet show. They've been traveling around and doing this for years together. So I hope you enjoy this interview with Nick. My name is Mick Darty, and I live in Portland, Oregon. For the last many decades, I've worked with my partner, Deborah Chase. Deb is a shadow puppeteer, and together we operate the Oregon Shadow Theater. So tell me a little bit, we, we've, we've discussed that, uh, that you yourself are not a puppeteer, you're sort of a uh, puppet support staff to, to, make, to make the show, and, and especially if anyone's ever watched a, a shadow puppet performance, there's a lot of, of things that go on literally behind the scenes to make that work. Can you tell us a little bit about what does go on with shadow yeah. puppetry specifically? Yeah, it's interesting. When I first uh, started working with Deb, when I met her and uh, before we got married, <laughs> she was already experimenting with shadow theater and she was trained as a visual artist. And uh, I was already working as a musician. She was performing with recorded music. She just put like in those days, a little boom box with some kind of music on. And uh, she asked me, would you be up for like singing a song or something while I do a shadow play to it? So that's how we started working together. And then I did some research and I learned that shadow theater has evidently pretty much traditionally always had live music accompanying it, whether it's the, uh, the Balinese shadow theater with gamelan orchestras or the Chinese theater where they'll have several musicians accompanying the shadow puppetry. We just work as a two person outfit. So she is behind the screen running the puppets and I'm actually seated out front off to the side, visible to the audience under real low light where I have my music and my sound effects. And then we both do voice acting for the puppets, well, which is also a little unusual for other puppeteers to wrap their heads around. Well, not too unusual, but for some folks that the fact that the voice acting is being done in some cases by someone other than the puppeteer. 
But but you do a lot of the uh, soundtrack, uh, right? I I am I have you know a number of you know snare drums, cymbals, woodblock, and lots of little percussion whistles, slide whistles, Acme whistles, and then I'll have like a lot of shows. Uh, let's see if this works over here. I have a hammered dulcimer. Sometimes I'll use a hammered dulcimer, guitar, accordion, banjo. I, I like whenever she decides to make a new show. Uh, like she was talking about doing a, a version of Puss in Boots. And it was uh, right around the time of Hurricane Katrina. And uh, she was thinking of the French version of Puss in Boots. And I thought, well, I could get a hurdy gurdy. But then she said, well, maybe we should do some benefit show for uh, for the hurricane victims. And I said, great, then I can get an accordion. <laughs> So, so I got an accordion and learned enough to do to do that show, and you know we did the jack tail, so I was able to buy a banjo. So, so I have fun that way, learning a new instrument for a show. One of the things I love about what y'all do is that your performance medium is totally live, which means that you know there's a lot of of different energy to that. Uh, with and y'all are separated by space. You know, you're not elbow to elbow, kind of working things out. You're separated by space, which has to present some challenges. So, what what's your process for developing uh, solutions to those challenges? Uh, how do you rehearse and and get all that done? Because I, I did. I cheated and I watched a couple of clips of y'all and it is it's smooth as silk. Well, thank you. But we do have to before we ever try to show out, we'll do often two or three weeks of rehearsals before we perform for anyone. And a lot of times we'll invite neighbor kids over or friends or we'll go to a neighborhood school and offer a free show before we go out and charge money for it, <laughs> because yeah, it, it's all about timing. The way the way our show works is when she's manipulating the puppet and relying on me to do the voice, it takes us quite a while to get our rhythm and our timing down. But, you know, we've worked together so long that it has gotten less arduous, the rehearsal process. So that's that's the main thing. Rehearsing, rehearsing. Well, Mick, all I right. sure appreciate you spending uh, the afternoon with me. Uh, pleasure. Yeah. Thanks, Glenn. All right, we will see you later. Take care. I've known this recipe since 56. It's fun to fit it in my bag of tricks. Parsley, sage, rosemary, and thyme. Mix what I call flower child number nine. Probably the top of puppetry that we are most familiar with is uh, the, the Muppet style, the hand puppet. We've all at some point in our life taken our sock and put it on our hand and pretended to talk to ourselves or to talk to other hands. Uh, classic hand puppetry is, is easy, but it's complex, and it can be incredibly difficult because you're not only having to create these, these puppets themselves, but you're having to act them, and sometimes... A single puppeteer is having to do two or three different characters with different voices and things like that. So we wanted to talk to someone who has a lot of experience with this, Mr. David Stevens. David has a uh, practicing professional puppeteer. He's been doing this for a very long time. And we want to know what it's like to be David. Well, we're so glad to have you with us today to talk about puppets and puppetry. It's something that I think everyone is familiar with, but a lot of people don't think much deeper than what they see on the screen. But they're, they need to know that there are people who actually make a living doing this and are professional craftsmen who can make these things come to life. So, so how did you first get interested in puppetry? I think like a lot of people of my generation, I grew up as a Muppet fan uh, and a real fan, a fanatic fan about it. <laughs> I was pretty obsessed by them as a, as a small child. I grew up with Sesame Street and The Muppet Show. They were both in their prime and their heyday. Uh, so I didn't have much exposure to live puppetry as an audience member, but uh, certainly as a television watcher, I was exposed to a lot of, t uh, of puppetry in the 70s and 80s. 
watching the Muppets and, and growing up and being fascinated about that, um, how did that begin to influence the types of puppetry that you do now? Well, the style of puppet that I work with is a Muppet style, a hand, a moving mouth, uh, hand puppet. Uh, and that, that's the type that I usually prefer to use. There was just something that really spoke to me about that, that there's something really immediate about uh, putting a puppet on your hand and, and having that direct control over it so that, you know, your hand is moving the mouth and the head and doing all the sort of gestures and just your whole arm uh, gets into the performance of a single puppet. And having that direct control is something that's really unique uh, to hand puppets and mouth puppets in particular, uh, especially like when you think about puppets like Kermit that are, have a pretty flexible mouth. And there was nothing in Kermit's head except Jim's hand. There was no foam or anything in there. So he could get really subtle little, you know, gestures and, and emotions just out of moving his hand, his fingers just a little bit. So right. it's pretty profound. And when you have that direct control, uh, how much emotion and expression you can get out of a puppet. When you think about the hand that's inside the thing, it changes your whole perspective. And that's kind of what I did. Uh, that was the transition. When I got to a point where I was thinking about the performers underneath those characters, and like I would try to pick out the different voices, who performed which characters, and that's how I could make the connections that Jim was doing these puppets and Frank Oz was doing these other characters. And so then it became a, a sort of game almost to figure out which performer was performing which puppet. Uh, and then you got to see a real broad range of characters that each of those puppeteers was performing. And then, and then it sort of like morphed into thinking about the mechanics of it all. Like how do these guys make what we see in the camera and, and the television frame happen below the frame? As you, you know, watch this and, and started to learn that, how do you hone that craft? How do you develop the skills? Well, it's like anything else. It's just a lot of practice. Um, and, and I have been at this for over 20 years now. And wow. so I think I kind of know what I'm doing. <laughs> but it's because, you know, I really started when I was a kid. I started making puppets when I was a teenager, just because I had so many ideas about characters of my own I wanted to make. It wasn't that I necessarily wanted to replicate uh, the Muppet characters specifically, but I wanted to work in that style of puppet and create my own characters. So I've been a builder and designer of puppets for as long as I've been a performer almost. And so it really is just about putting in the time. It's like playing a musical instrument or really just being good at anything. You have to put in that time uh, to develop that that skill set that allows you to to be able to do that almost without thinking. Well, and you you were just talking too about you know you're creating the puppets and you're building them too, right? How much of what you do is thinking about how to make and craft that puppet to turn the skills that you do with your hand into an actual you know great performance? They're they're very integrated. Now there are some in my field that are strictly performers and there are some who are strictly builders. Uh, then there are a few of us who are both. <laughs> that seems and like can, it would be more fun. <laughs> well, it's 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 about being a more informed builder and a more in, informed performer by having the knack and the ability to do both because you know what the capacity and the capabilities of your hand are so you can take those things into consideration when you're designing the thing. It's very easy to design a puppet that you can't actually perform uh, because of its size or it's just what it has to do or whatever. Right. So I think it becomes very imperative to be able to think about not only the the capacities that you have in your hand, but the limitations of it too. It's a very organic and integrated process for me that it's a hand in glove uh, <laughs> notion. Fantastic. Well, David, uh, thanks so much for joining us. It has been a great pleasure to talk to you and I hope to uh, see you again and your uh, work in the future. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's been a blast. Thank you. We're not only talking about uh, traditional European puppetry or modern puppetry, we want to look at some more traditional methods too. And one of the most uh, traditional methods, one of the most popular traditional methods is bunraku, which is traditional Japanese puppetry. Uh, we don't get as much of this in the United States as I wish we did because it, is, it goes all the way back to medieval and Renaissance Japan. And it is, you could say, very spiritual. And it's very rare that uh, Westerners are able to get a glimpse of this, especially the further back you go. It was, it was sort of a guarded secret. And only recently has, uh, have Europeans become puppeteers in the traditional Japanese puppetry style. And we are very fortunate today to have with us Mr. Martin Holman, who will be sharing with us his experiences of 
being a Westerner in a in a uh, Asian land, talking to uh, how he got started getting into bunraku traditional Japanese puppetry and going forward with that and becoming uh, not only a performer but a teacher as well. My name's Martin Holman. I'm originally from uh, Kentucky. I currently live in uh, Tokushima, Japan, on the island of Shikoku, just southwest of uh, Osaka. How did you How did you become interested in in puppetry generally? And in is it uh, bunraku? Am I pronouncing that correctly? Bunraku actually refers to the traditional puppet theater of Osaka. Um, the generic term is harder to pronounce, and that's why bunraku is easier to say. Uh, it's ningyo joruri, or you could just say traditional Japanese puppet theater. <laughs> but bunraku is the, was, came from one of the, the name of one of the theaters in Osaka that was the most popular theater, and that became the generic name to a lot of people. Mm. When I was a, a little kid, when I was four years old, actually, the very first time I wrote a letter to Santa Claus and asked for anything, I asked for a marionette. And it was a, it was a Pinocchio marionette from the Sears Roebuck catalog. Mm. And the year after that, my dad made a puppet stage for me. And you could turn it one direction and use it for marionettes, dropping them from above with the puppeteer hidden and then you could he, he you turned it backwards and you could use it for glove puppets like this tell us a little bit about the process of you uh developing your skills with traditional japanese uh puppetry and how you have since um developed the mm -hmm. this art uh not just for yourself but for all of your students i was doing a lot of um research, just finding which troops were still extant. I had seen one troop that was in northeast of Kyoto. I tried to call several times, but no one ever answered the phone. Found out the phone was in the theater, not the director's house. Someone said, well, they rehearse on Saturday nights at seven. Why don't you just go? And uh, so I just went and I showed up in the evening at their theater and surprised them probably. Um, and they showed me around. I watched them rehearse. They showed me their collection of puppets and everything. And we were just sitting and talking and they said, is there anything else you need or want to know? And I thought, well, this is my chance. Um, I said, well, actually, um, you know, I thought they could laugh or just throw me out. And I said, the, I um, would like to be trained as a puppeteer. And they said, okay, well, we rehearse tomorrow at seven, come back. Anyway, I, I started training, and that's how I became the first foreigner ever to train in anywhere in Japan in the traditional theater. I, that was uh, August or September, and I made my debut the following spring in uh, April. And there were five TV crews <laughs> that showed up to cover it. Mm -hmm. Why is it important? that we see this type of puppetry performance? What does it bring to us that other types of puppetry performance can't? They can do such graceful, close movements. And with traditional Japanese puppets, the hands are really important, but the hands are, you know, the hands are so expressive and the hands with the face now, I know I'm not as beautiful as a Japanese puppet, but imagine, okay? Right. <laughs> but you can do these wonderful kinds of movements with the puppet's hand and, and head, you know, together. We did a, we did a movie um, that was selected for Sundance Film Festival um, in 2017. And um, it's um, a short uh, 13, 14 minute movie and we do, you know, we, I did the puppets, me and my people did the puppets for it. And uh, it's um, the, the puppetry is completely traditional puppetry. Oh, we'll, we'll share that link and get our viewers to, to see as much of it as they can. Thank you so much for spending a little bit of your evening with us uh, to, to share the story of this, this fascinating art form. Well, it is really a wonderful 
you know, a wonderful art form that more people need to need to see. Now, sometimes you get to see some puppetry that blends a lot of different things, and that's what we're going to do next. Mr. Bemay Bott is someone who has studied a lot of uh, traditional European marionette puppetry, but he has used that to tell very traditional Indian stories with song, dance, music, uh, folklore, and things like that. So it's really interesting to see the different ways that these cross-cultural and very diverse approaches to puppetry and performance arts can be blended to create something that perhaps hasn't existed before or perhaps makes all the different components into something that's a little bit better. So let's go talk to Bemay. So Vinay, thank you so much for joining us. Um, first off, I just want to know, how did you become interested in puppetry in the first place? Puppetry and making puppetry, like uh, making traditional puppet is my ancestral art. It is a heritage, which is, which is passed from generation to generation. Actually, my grandfather was a national award in puppetry. So right from my childhood, I was fascinated by this art and grow up watching my family making puppets and doing shows and all. And when I was seven, I joined, uh, I joined this uh, heritage art and uh, I started making puppets and participated in my family shows after my school. I, I started uh, participating in uh, various competitions also and developed uh, a special love for this uh, craft of puppet making and performing. Growing up, I took workshops from eminent artists, uh, artists like uh, Mr. Dadi Padamji, uh, Anrupa Roy, have performed many, um, um, performed modern and traditional plays. So this is how I interested to get interested in puppetry. <laughs> That's fascinating. So it's a long tradition in India, but also a long tradition in your family as well. So you are carrying on the tradition <laughs> of your family. That's that's really cool. Now, can you describe uh, your form of puppetry? How is it uh, different than other forms? What makes it special? Usually I perform a Rajasthani traditional string puppet, which is called Katputli. Kat is uh, wood. Putli means puppet performed nationally forms such as modern puppetry and uh, Muppet, Bunraku, uh, mask actor puppet, uh, shadow puppet uh, and uh, experimental puppet also. So this this is a string puppet. Wow. Yeah. So I made this and made out paper mache. Only paper mache. It's wow. all a paper mache. And this is only wood. It's really beautiful. Let me show you something. So, hello, my friend. How are you? Uh, and do you know my, my lips is working? And... Oh, oh, oh. Wow. Hmm. So it's that's amazing. So the eyes puppet. are moving. That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> so when you when you perform, what kind of stories do you tell with your puppets? Uh, so mostly um, my show centered around uh, social themes, uh, which uh, which to be which to influence all kind of audiences. Uh, like for example, uh, I have done shows on anti-corruption. Dengu prevention, road safety, mental health, and uh, many, many, many. Apart from that, I also do shows that uh, that narrate uh, current affair, current affairs, moral, moral stories, and our and uh, help help bring uh, history to life. Yeah, so it's it's educational. It also helps people understand issues of the world. So this is really a way to communicate to people in an entertaining way, in an imaginative way. Uh, and it's also a great way, like you said, to uh, preserve history of this traditional art form. So, um, Vinay, yeah. I, I'm wondering, do you have a, 
a favorite thing about being a puppeteer? I get to learn so many different skills from uh, this. Uh, I told you, huh? like uh, I shoe making, shoe making because we make up puppets shoes. We uh, choreography, choreography. and um, because we choreograph our dance and uh, yeah and direction we direct our shows and uh, uh, carpenter we make the setup so so dress designer and the painter and writer we write scripts and music director also and light design also and many skills are there so so there's a may and there's many 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 skills right right so puppetry it has all of these art forms in one so it's it's art it's education it's design uh, it's writing it's it's all of these things in in one art form so uh, i'm sure yeah, you exactly. you keep very busy i'm sure <laughs> Well, um Vinay, it has been fascinating speaking with you. I'm very much looking forward to sharing your artwork and your form of puppetry with our audiences. Um and is there anything else that you would like to share? How can people know more about Puppet Kala? Uh, last year I have started an organization called Kala. Puppet Kala means puppet, you know, voice puppet. And Kala means art. So mm. pup art. a uh, works toward puppets puppet shows and traditional handicrafts and workshops catering uh, to the to all age groups even even as young as 5 uh, years <laughs> so we excel in different uh, art forms such as puppetry drum player fire dance uh, juggling acrobatics so my reason is that the youth of india sees a puppetry as a career choice uh, in india uh, if you ask to anyone in a school or everywhere anywhere huh what do you be a become what do you be become they will say i want to be a become pilot i want to be become doctor i want to be a become singer actor uh, director and many many but no one can say that that uh, i want to be a puppeteer so i wish that more people are attracted towards this beautiful art and i'm working with all my heart to, to achieve this and i hope one day i am able to fulfill this dream yes well uh you've certainly so, uh, inspired so many people it sounds like and i'm sure that through your words here today that you will inspire more vene uh, thank you so much for sharing your story sharing your art with us today we really appreciate it and anyone who is uh watching will be able to uh, visit your facebook page with puppet kala and to see your work uh on there as well so vene thank you so much i really appreciate you speaking with us today You know, again, we think of puppetry as something for kids, and there is, fortunately, a lot of puppetry that's out there for kids. And as I said previously, it's easy to kind of put it all in a box and travel it around and do shows. So, but it takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of time on the road, and being small like that means that the the puppeteers uh, could also be the business owners, the business managers, the accountants, the the transportation people, the creation people, all those things. And so today we're going to talk to Miss Nancy Riggs who actually runs her own puppetry show, runs her own puppetry business and does a lot for a lot of kids. And one of the great things she does is not just entertain, but she uses her story, she uses her puppetry medium to teach morals and to teach important lessons of life. So let's talk to Nancy. Well, my name is Nancy Riggs and I'm a puppeteer. I am the director of a little nonprofit puppet company called Piccadilly Puppets which has been in Atlanta for 50 years now. Well, how did you become uh interested in puppetry? What was your background and how did you uh how did you end up in the the puppetry performing arts? I was looking for work as actors kind of always are and um this was back in 1990 i went to a big uh, theater conference and i ran into a friend who was working in the shop at the 
Center for Puppetry Arts. And he suggested that I audition for the touring show. And I said, well, I don't know anything about puppetry. And he said, well, they will train you. So I called them up and they said, uh, would you like to work with the director before the audition? And I said, well, yes. And so John Ludwig, who is um, an amazing puppeteer, uh, was directing the show. And so he actually set up a time to just kind of show me the puppets and how to do them. And he spent like an hour. And um, so I got hired. And uh, once I got hired, I realized that I did puppetry all the time as a kid. They just weren't called puppets. I just always took my stuffed animals and moved them and made them come to life and gave them voices. And that's all that puppetry is. So um, I really found that I had an affinity for it. What type of puppetry uh, performance art do you do? Well, I... I brought, um, uh, we do a couple of different styles and I've got a couple of puppets here. Um, the main two kinds that we use are rod puppets and man puppets. So um, our most popular show is called Butterfly Ballad. And this is Katie the butterfly. And she's just on a puppet on a stick, basically. <laughs> and all I need to do to make her fly is just move the stick up and down. And I let air resistance and gravity do the rest. So that's... Um, an example of a rod puppet. The rod puppets can also have um, mechanisms on them where uh, maybe pull down on a string to make something happen with a puppet, a leg go up or something. Or um, this is from the same show. This is Katie before she turns into the caterpillar. And Pam Shook, a puppeteer that used to live in Atlanta, made this puppet out of kitchen tongs because that <laughs> way you can get... Um, you have to be able to move it with one hand and with the kitchen tongs, you can get that motion that the caterpillar makes rather than just having to jump it around, which and she does some too. But, and then she also has a, a, a rod that goes up to her head with this little loop on it. And so she can, um, she can look around by just moving that rod. I can stick my finger through it. <laughs> that is very clever. Um, another kind of puppet we use a lot is a hand puppet. So this guy is from our show, Twas the Night Before Christmas. It's the star Herbert. Hello. <laughs> and um, these are nice and lightweight. They're easy to carry. They're not too expensive to make. <laughs> so there's a lot of uh, benefits to hand puppets here. What kind of skills and development of skill sets does it take to be a good puppeteer? Well, to me, the number one thing that's necessary is the imagination. If you cannot look at this and imagine it alive, then none of the other work is going to work because um, that that's just kind of the most important thing. Um, I'm excited that uh, we had an old show called Cherokee Tales that have been around for like 30 years. So a couple of years ago, I started putting my feelers out for a Native American playwright and I found a playwright, Kara Morrison, who happens to be, um, well, she's a couple of different, a member of a different nation, but she has Cherokee ancestry as well. And she's grew up in North Carolina. So um, she helped us to update the show and mm -hmm. uh, change it around and make sure things were more um, accurate, more depicting the Cherokees the way they would like to be depicted. And um now we're hoping to be able to do it in person again and use kids as volunteers. So we've been um, getting new uh, props and costume pieces and puppets and things made for that and hope to start rehearsing it in a couple of weeks. That sounds fascinating. Native American history is really cool. And uh, pulling that into puppetry, uh, performing arts is a medium I hadn't considered before, but that's a pretty good idea. Well done. Thanks, Nancy. Take care. Now, as I previously mentioned, we have continued to use puppetry arts in so many different television and movie productions because sometimes it's really cool to see, sometimes it's way cheaper than digital effects, and sometimes it's just what you need to really connect with an audience, even though you're having to do it through a, through a screen or at a theater or something like that. But, but there are folks out there who have really focused on this type of performance, television and movie performance. Uh, this is, uh, some people maybe consider the big time, 
Uh, but we've talked to someone who's in that big time by the name of Mr. Raymond Carr. Raymond has done a lot of different television and movie puppeteer things uh, from small things to being a puppeteer on a huge puppet where he was only one of six or seven folks operating this gigantic thing for television. It's it's a really different medium. Uh, it can be more complex because you're often integrating not just traditional puppetry arts, you're integrating more technology like re uh, remote control uh, motors for eyes and noses and things like that, which they still give to puppeteers. It's almost as if that's what a puppeteer's job is. But to get more detail on that, let's talk to Raymond. So my name is Raymond Carr, and I'm Atlanta-based puppeteer. Uh, I've been working as a puppeteer for over 20 years now. Um, got my start working actually in the church with my parents. They they had a we had a ministry team that we would travel around and do uh, schools and churches and uh, different events in the inner city uh on the west coast and then from there i moved to atlanta uh, where i discovered the center for puppetry arts which was really a godsend and a lifesaver honestly because we were new to the city and didn't really know anything about anything now i'm, I'm up in uh I'm still living in atlanta but i work in um la quite a bit with the jim henson company and mm -hmm. cartoon network and um uh, Nickelodeon Studios and several other companies. So I've been uh, privileged to be able to have some uh, some good runs here and there working in puppetry. So if you've been doing this for 20 years plus, really, uh, you've got a lot of experience under your belt. What type of puppetry theater, puppetry arts do you perform? So uh, I, I'm pretty uh, all over the place as needed. Um, I work a lot in television these days, film and television. Um, I, I generally actually don't really do much theater at all these days. Um, so when I worked in television uh, with the Jim Henson company, it can be anything from traditional like Muppet style puppetry, hand and rod puppetry, what we call, or uh, I've kind of got a niche into um, animatronic uh, puppetry, mm. which is creature effects, you know, uh, monsters and aliens and that kind of stuff uh, that utilize a lot of the similar uh, principles that uh, I learned at the Center for Puppetry Arts uh, with just general puppetry, how, how to make this inanimate object come to life. You, you know, work professionally. You, you do so much. You make a living doing this. Uh, folks, if you haven't looked up uh, Raymond Carr on the Internet, do so. He's kind of a big deal. Uh, but, <laughs> Don't but oversell you're, it. <laughs> <laughs> you're right on the cutting edge of you know, puppetry performance, television and movies and things like that. Where, where is puppetry going in that medium, in that profession in the next decade or, or, or a couple of decades, do you think? Well, what's great is that there is still um, a need and desire uh, for performers, uh, practical effects. And, um, you know, we, we went over this time in our uh our entertainment life cycle where uh, CG characters were something that everybody wanted to do and figure out how to do computer generated characters that were the most realistic thing ever. And it just became um, uh, just a mess, you know, there was just so much out there. Um, and now, you know, especially with shows like The Mandalorian and a lot of stuff that, uh, you know, Disney's doing and, and uh, other com uh, companies, they're seeing the value of having that tangible character, that tangible costume or puppet, and then enhancing it with computer generated elements. So I think that um, we've already seen the far furthest that we can go with like computer generated technology. And what's exciting is to see how uh, we can blend uh, the practical effects and um, more traditional, honestly, traditional puppetry effects with, uh, you know, computer generated technology to make something wholly unique that still feels very grounded and, and, and uh, interesting. Well, thank you so much for spending some time with us. This has been a fascinating conversation. Uh, is there anything that that we haven't covered that you think needs to be said before we uh, sign off? Uh, you know, I think that it's just uh, for those of you who are interested in puppetry, there are community, the community is growing and growing, especially with the pandemic, you know, people are starting to put their own stuff out there, starting to connect with other people through social media. So I would suggest just 
uh, go on a deep dive. There's always way more people doing what you want to do than you think. <laughs> that's, that's what I always think. It, it can feel kind of lonely if you're the the only person in your community that is into the weird stuff. Uh, but uh, just reach out because there's a lot more people doing it and they may be closer than you think. All right. Perfect. Well, Raymond, thank you so much. Uh, this has been fascinating and we uh, hope to see some of your stuff on TV and in the movie soon. Thank you so much. So folks, that is the history of puppetry and the current state of puppetry in a nutshell. It's incredibly fascinating. As I said earlier, and I have to say it again to drive this home, it's pretty fascinating that something that was developed 3,000 years ago is still so central to our entertainment and to our storytelling. That tells me that it is something that touches each and every one of us very significantly. It is such an important tool that we here at the Northeast Georgia History Center have even incorporated it into our programming. Perhaps you've heard of hands-on history, where we tell stories about historical figures with starstruck students learning more and more about them. Wow. You should look at this on our website and on YouTube because they're a lot of fun. Now, we couldn't do programs like that. We couldn't do programs like this without your support. If you are already a member, thank you so much. If you are not, please consider becoming a member. Go to our website and click on membership, and that can tell you how you can support us and get lots of great benefits. That's all we have time for, so we hope that you have had a great time. We hope you've learned something. And until we see you at the History Center again, stay safe and take care.